Hello, world. Hello, Mulberry. I'm Creed Henshaw, the interim senior pastor at Mulberry Street United Methodist Church, right in downtown Macon, Georgia. So glad that you are with us today. This is the sixth Sunday of Easter, and I might add it is the tenth Sunday that you and I have been apart from each other, and I'm, I can't believe it has been ten weeks. Uh, a few minutes ago, I went and stood up in the pulpit. I just wanted to see what it felt like in that pulpit and um, assured that pulpit that at some point the gospel would be proclaimed from it again. We don't know when that's going to be yet. We want to be safe for you and for the larger community, and we also want to be able to offer a, a worship service when we get back together that is deeply meaningful for you as well. So uh, let's just go enjoy each other this way through um, YouTube or however you're watching right now and uh, pray that God will be with us as we move forward to that day when we can hug on each other's necks again. May the peace of Christ be with you. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Be joyful in God, all you lands. Be joyful, all the earth. Sing the glory of God's name. Sing the glory of God's praise. Come, all you people, come and praise your Maker. Come now and worship the Lord.
in the deathly silence of our sin and restored your song of life and triumph. By the power of your Spirit, inspire us to shout your praise and joy and to tell of the wonderful things you have done. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to listen to the Word of God. I am reading from Peter's first letter, chapter 3, beginning at verse 15 and reading through verse 19. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of the hope that is in you. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I turned on this video on YouTube last week. Um, the title of it just sucked me in. Hell still exists. I knew I probably shouldn't watch it, and I really felt like turning it off almost immediately, but you know what? I'm preaching on YouTube now, and maybe it kind of made me a little bit more sympathetic to the fella who was trying to get the message across. So I watched for a while. He was a nice enough looking guy. He had a cup of coffee in one hand and a Bible in the other hand, and uh, he said to us right away, uh, you know, most churches don't talk about hell anymore, but I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to describe to you very accurately what hell is like. He started from the book of Genesis. He went all the way through the book of Revelation. We visited the lake of fire, the outer darkness, uh, brimstone, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, eternal agony. Fifteen minutes later, I turned off the video and awarded myself a medal. I, you know, I got to thinking he sort of did introduce me to hell, but maybe not exactly in the way that uh, he intended. I began thinking about one part of what he said uh, that he, uh, I'm really not sure I agree with. He said, most churches don't tell you this stuff. Well, frankly, in my experience, there are a whole lot of churches who really like to talk about hell. Uh, they talk about it all the time, and I, I rather assume that they are some of the same churches or people who put these billboards up and down I-75 that warn me that hell is real and that I'm going to flatline one day and that there's going to be a judgment coming. Frankly, our Methodist pews, uh, when we used to sit in pews, are full of a lot of escapees from churches like that, that preached far too much condemnation and damnation. 
So I think there are plenty of churches out there who are talking about hell. What I don't quite understand is why you would want to spend so much time talking about hell and not uh, enough time talking about the one who has power over hell. Why would you want to spend so much time talking about being locked up in hell instead of talking about the one who said in the book of Revelation, I hold the keys to hell. That's where I would rather have my conversation uh, about the one who has power over hell and death rather than all of these uh, literalistic explanations of hell itself. First Peter chapter 4 says that the gospel was even preached to the dead. The gospel was preached to the dead. And if you listened carefully to the verses I read from 1 Peter chapter 3, you will have recognized perhaps that a, a part of those verses sounds a little bit like a first century affirmation of faith. Listen to these words of Peter. Christ suffered for our sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Doesn't that sound like an affirmation? Once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. He was put to death in the flesh, made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now it's that last little part of that verse that I want to talk to you about today. Because the early church, from the earliest days, always understood that to mean that Christ, after he died, descended into hell. After he died, Peter says, in the spirit, he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Peter doesn't mean that he went to Caesar's jail or that he went to some county lockup. Peter means, and the church has always understood it, Jesus descended to hell after he died on the day between Friday of the cross and Sunday of the resurrection. He went and preached to those who were in prison. Our ancestors knew that, our spiritual ancestors. The earliest affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, which we Methodists love to recite, has that phrase in it, he descended into hell. Our spiritual ancestors would be shocked and horrified to see that we have relegated that to an asterisk. If you had a hymnal in front of you, I'd make you turn it to page 881. We Methodists don't say that, it's just kind of down there in the asterisk. But our ancestors knew that our Lord descended to the dead. He preached to those who were held captive by Satan and he released them all. They called that the harrowing of hell. Yeah, that's kind of just like the church, you know. We, we use these quaint old phrases that nobody knows what they mean, and we've used them for four or five hundred years now. Back when that phrase was first used, to harrow meant to destroy, to pulverize. Jesus, when he went and descended um, to the spirits in the underworld, he destroyed hell. My wife and I raised um, three boys. Back when they were younger, the two oldest boys would a lot of times build castles, impressive castles with their building blocks and their Legos. The youngest of the three was not old enough to know how to build. He only knew how to tear down. 
And so the younger two would build these elaborate castles and try to protect them. But try as hard as they could, the littlest guy always found them, always got to them, and always tore them up. They nicknamed him the Devastator. Well, Jesus is the Devastator in this verse. He suffered. He died. He was crucified. Um, he descended into hell. He harrowed hell. And the church in the Middle Ages loved this story. If you go to churches in Europe in the Middle Ages, you will find the harrowing of hell painted on church walls. You will find it depicted in stained glass. You will find it in mosaic. Uh, you will find it in icons. You will find it in woodcuts. This week I've been looking um, on uh, the internet at some of these woodcuts. There is one I'm particularly uh, uh, attracted to by uh, Albrecht Durer. Some of you know Durer. He's the one that uh, etched the, the praying hands. Uh, Durer has depicted the harrowing of hell, a victorious Jesus standing on the door to hell. He's knocked it down. Uh, devils everywhere, uh, hiding in the doors, hiding under the doors. They look terrified and uh, uh, upset. Jesus reaching down into hell to pull out a victim. And there behind that victim stands Adam and Eve waiting their turn and the whole host of hell waiting for, to be rescued by Jesus. The harrowing of hell. In 13th century England, well before Shakespeare, uh, traveling actors companies uh, went through England portraying uh, this drama of the harrowing of hell. Man, it, can you uh, see having that? Well, do it at the Cherry Blossom Festival one year. Uh, uh, maybe get folk from this church to be actors. I'll be Jesus, somebody else can be the devil. No, no, the devil always gets the best part in these things. But, but in this play, uh, uh, you know, Jesus comes up to the devil and he says, I, I want Adam back. And the devil says, you can't have him. He ate the apple. And uh, Jesus said, well, you forgot that God made the apple and the apple tree. He's mine, not yours. And Jesus takes Adam and everybody else with him. I, I hope... Uh, you, you get the point of, uh, of what Peter is trying to say here. Jesus suffered for sin. He was crucified. Uh, he was uh, uh, killed in the flesh, but he was made alive in the spirit, and he descended. And he grabbed uh, the hostages and brought them to freedom. It was like a, a commando raid. You say, well... Yeah, that's First Peter. And it is First Peter, but you can find that uh, hopeful theology throughout the Bible. Uh, Psalm 139, always one of my favorites, where the psalmist says, uh, where can I flee, Lord, that you're not there? There's no place on earth that I can go where you're not already there. And he says in verse 8, even if I go to hell, even if I go to Sheol, you, O oh Lord, are there. Uh, there's not a place where God in Christ cannot be found. And really, one of my favorite confessions of faith in the New Testament is from uh, the second chapter of Philippians. Perhaps you will remember this, where Paul says the time will come where every knee will bow. Remember that? Every knee will bow where? Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and where? Under the earth, beneath the earth. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This this idea of the destruction of hell 
death of death and hell's destruction. Uh, It's been a part of the heritage of the church forever. And as far as we Methodists are concerned, I suppose we could talk about hellfire, but Charles Wesley um, was more interested in the hymns he wrote in writing about sacred fire. Why would we talk about fire that is going to burn you after death when we can talk about the sacred fire of the Holy Spirit, which Wesley prayed would would flow through our bodies while we're alive and burn up in us that part which God didn't want. So I'm happy to leave the hellfire to others and talk about the sacred fire here in this church. Our brothers and sisters in the um, Orthodox faith, what we like to call sometimes the Eastern Orthodox Church, is really pretty much half of Christianity, they've always been more attracted to this story than we have. The Orthodox Church is not so much uh, interested on Easter in the empty tomb, they are more interested in the empty hell. And so in the Orthodox Church, uh, Holy Saturday is a huge day, and their depictions of Easter is not the empty tomb, it's Jesus rescuing people from hell. And on Easter Sunday morning, in the Orthodox Church, the sanctuary is packed with people, but the priest is outside the church. The doors are closed, and the priest is banging on the church doors as hard as he can. Uh, He's saying, let me in, let me in. They are depicting this harrowing of hell, and the doors spring open, and the lights come on, and they burn the incense, and the priest comes in, and the uh, prisoners are released. This destruction, this harrowing of hell, is one of the elements of Easter that we often forget. So let me just say, if you're still with me, you've given me about 15 minutes, which is about all I could stand to give my friend on the internet. So hang on for just a couple more minutes, or if you're going to stop right now, just click your, pat yourself on the back and give yourself a medal. I just want to finish with one more story, one more image. Every time there is an earthquake somewhere, uh, there is such a huge pile of destruction. And we always see this uh, very touching scene where people come in after the quake is over and begin looking for survivors. And they might have with them a ground-penetrating radar. Uh, They might have with them specially trained dogs. But oftentimes, they're ordinary people like you and me, down on their hands and knees, putting their hands into the rubble, one stone after another, pulling off the rubble, pulling out the stones, uh, looking through, combing through the disaster to find that one last living victim. That's Jesus. That's, that's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus does. Let other people preach uh, all they want about hell and who it is full of. I am grateful that First Peter left us with this confession of faith for the one who preached to the spirits in prison and destroyed very hell himself. Thanks be to God.
long-time Methodists know that the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, is on page 881. You probably have it at home, uh, I hope, printed in your worship bulletin. We're going to recite it together. I'm here, you're there, we're all together. But I want to warn you, there's a new phrase in there. It's an old phrase, descended into hell, be ready. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day into heaven. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, that in Jesus you hold the keys to hell and death. May your spirit flow through every part of our body, that all that you do not like in us, all that is sin in us, might be burned away, and that we might be living uh, witnesses to your love. These things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. scattered flock. Be God's people this week. Speak for justice. Walk humbly. Love others. 
do so in the name and in the power of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.